When um, I was putting this presentation together and I looked at what time I was presenting, I thought, oh great, it's a time when everybody's looking at their watches and thinking, well, is it lunch yet? And is this guy going to get off? And so we can all get our sandwiches. So what could I do to try and engage a little bit of interest before everybody goes off and, and wants to do that? And I thought, well, you guys predominantly all working with the NHS, you've always seen something that's shocking in terms of hands being in the pudding, someone's using the gloves for invasive surgery. That's not going to shock you. So I thought I'd use something completely different. And that was basically what proved to be the most successful online advertising campaign in the world to date that was focused on a customer base in the United States. And for anybody who thinks that this involves foul language, it doesn't, but I encourage you to listen very, very carefully. Guys, can you run the tape, please? Ship my pants? Right here? Ship my pants, you're kidding. You can ship your pants right here. You hear that? I can ship my pants for free. Wow, I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. I just ship my pants and it's very convenient. Very convenient. I just ship my drawers. I just shipped my nightie. I just shipped my bed. If you can't find what you're looking for in store, we'll find it at Kmart.com right now and ship it to you for free. Always gets a giggle. That advert got 16 million hits in 30 minutes. It eclipsed any type of advertising campaign that's ever been undertaken before. And at the same time, they appealed to a brand new audience who basically jumped on this and through social media communicated that this was something that was fun, entertaining and worth seeing. And sales basically rose as a result. But there's a message to take away from that. And that's think different. It's the same in the NHS. If you're trying to offer something as a new SME, try and offer something different. Don't try and be a me too. Give value. Give something that other people can't. And that will typically guarantee you a reception. We, at Leanvation, took a different approach as far as surgical gloves are concerned. Every surgical glove business to date has been focused on either offering latex surgical gloves or latex free and latex surgical gloves. We don't bother with the latex element. And that delivers key benefits, which we'll come on to in a moment of time. This quotation is something that I like to seize upon, which comes from my past time working with the, the market leader following a visit to a procurement manager at a major hospital in the Netherlands. There is simply too much choice, and every surgeon has their own preference. Inventory control becomes a nightmare, not to mention costs. A company could provide us with an acceptable latest free glove range in thick and thin variants, plus puncture indication, they could have our business. Now, to put that into perspective, the typical number of product lines, just in terms of surgical gloves, at an NHS trust is typically um, 180, 88 product lines from a leading manufacturer. That's a massive number of product lines just servicing one particular need. In terms of how we can look to tackle that, the key is basically embracing the latest in technology as far as material science is concerned. With the product range that we're offering, which is focused pure and simply on polyisoprene, so there's not any latex involved at all, it performs as good or better than latex and feels much better to the surgeons as well. So typically they embrace it. It removes the threat of type 1 allergies and critically type 4 allergies, which can have career-threatening consequences. And it, from an efficiency point of view, removes the need to carry both latex and latex-free gloves. So in one foul swoop, you remove the potential need for any latex gloves in your inventory. Going back to what the lady in the Netherlands said, in listening to that message, we developed three gloves. One is essentially a thick, a thin, and an indicating underglove. There is simply not a need for anything more than that. So, how has this been received in the marketplace? Well, the latest clinical evaluation that we've undertaken has been at the Liverpool Women's NHS Foundation Trust. And conscious of the time, I'm not going to spend too much um, on, on this, but just to give you a flavour, all of the results that we saw across all of the key attributes were incredibly positive. No real negative performing attributes whatsoever. 62% of people basically said that they currently use a latex surgical glove. 
And yet, despite this, despite latex being heralded as the gold standard of surgical gloving, we saw that 86% of people were willing to drop their latex gloves and use these latex free products. Not only are we looking at a direct saving in terms of like for like costs, but there are additional cost savings to be had as well from an occupational health perspective. If we look here, and there was a mention about the power of freedom of information requests earlier. This is just one such piece of evidence that has stemmed from being able to harness getting access to this amount of data. You can see on the far left, basically, costs associated with a single patient adverse event, with basically a member of staff having to take time off work, all associated with either latex allergy or dermatological um, allergies as a result of wearing gloves. It cannot be right that a device that is aimed to provide safety is currently presenting risk for those people who continue to use latex gloves. Where this has been of incredible importance has been the NGOs who are currently fighting the outbreaks of Ebola in West Africa. And they have seen basically that moving to our product range can basically remove a lot of risk for their healthcare workers and the people that they are actually trying to assist who unfortunately are suffering at this moment in time. They basically have already in the last few weeks placed an order for 30,000 pairs and we're looking to support them with in excess of 40,000 pairs during November. They cannot take the risk of their healthcare workers having itchy hands and taking the gloves off to give them a scratch when they're basically in the presence of the virus. And we're pleased to be able to support them. So, all of this sounds incredibly positive. One would think that this should be an easy sell to the NHS. But obviously, as an SME, that's not always the case. One thing that's quite daunting is the fact that the market share is principally controlled by a number of three companies in principle. And a very small amount, 25%, is basically just owned by everybody else. So it's an incredibly difficult market to enter. We also see restrictions to entry from frameworks. And when we had a, a framework opportunity to apply for recently, we were presented, we question one, which says, and I quote, is the annual turnover of the potential provider at least one million times the turnover threshold? Mm. For a new business who's only been operating for 12 months, that's a little bit difficult to be able to meet as a requirement. I have to say, thanks in no end to the help of the HSN and Lorna and her team in particular, we were able to navigate this and we got on the framework concerned. So to the SMEs that are in the room, I would encourage you, don't be daunted by these type of restrictions and hurdles that you may face in trying to win market share. With support, you can overcome them. What type of obstacles do we as an SME face, however, on an ongoing basis? Well, time is a key one. The pace of change within NHS is incredibly slow. It's a massive organization, and that can present major hurdles for smaller companies. There's also, at the moment, a distrust typically of smaller businesses. We've seen cases where, despite being asked to provide a litany of due diligence material to support the fact that we're going to be around and we're not going to go out of business anytime soon, that basically confidence still doesn't exist. Another key area where we struggle is a lack of transparency. We understand that hospitals basically have to approach procurement projects in an ordered way. And we also understand that sometimes our offering won't be of interest. But it's incredibly frustrating when a hospital will pledge to commit to at least evaluating your gloves. And you'll go through telephone call and meeting after meeting, only to find basically that you're then putting a holding position and then you don't have phone calls or emails returned. Transparency is key. We've already talked about national framework access and compliance. Yes, it's a trouble for a young company when you're met with a five-year framework agreement and you have to wait for the next round of applications to be able to get on that. But again, these are things that we face on a day-to-day basis as do every other SME. And we're working with trust to try and overcome those obstacles. In terms of 
two particular trusts that I would really like to herald and champion and thank them for the support that they've provided so far. Both Liverpool women, Women's and Lancashire Teaching Hospitals have been incredible. Um, they have embraced us as an SME as best as they possibly could. In the case of Lanx Teaching Hospitals, they basically committed to an evaluation within two weeks of the first meeting and they committed to basically a rollout of the product six weeks thereafter and we have a working program in place with them now to do that. At Liverpool Women's, that happened over a four week period. Great support, great engagement, they couldn't have done anything more. So again, to the SMEs in the room, there will be some circumstances where you don't receive that level of support, but there are other cases where you will. Take heart. I think another key recommendation would be for an SME in the room, the importance of strategic partnerships. We've had some great support from the Northwest Coast team. They've been critically important in terms of providing us with customer-facing opportunities and getting us engaged with procurement and clinical procurement across the NHS, and we're eternally grateful for that. We're also fortunate enough to be a strategic partner of Bonzel Insurance Healthcare. So we are one of the few brands, basically, within their product assortment that are still independently owned, but we are marketed as an internal brand, and they handle all of our logistics, all of our invoicing, and our debt recovery. So that takes the sting out of the cash flow that often the smaller companies face. APSIS as well, who I know are in the room today and also have a stand outside, have been fantastic in terms of supporting us with applications for tenders and framework agreements. And their knowledge from having experience in public procurement has been invaluable. And again, I would encourage any SME here to speak with them. So, what next for us as a young well, company? Well, we're not resting on our laurels. We've been now launched on the market since January of this year. We're building on our product range, which is very innovative in nature, with new technologies. Again, we've fostered a strategic partnership with Inventia at Desbury Science Park, who are supporting us in that regard. We've successfully won a grant from the Technology Strategy Board, now Innovate UK, to support us with one research project, and we're going to be filing an application for another very, very soon, with the hope of bringing more efficiency benefits, more value, more clinical benefits to the NHS. Our last word of thanks basically goes to both Enterprise Ventures and the Northwest Fund for Business, who, without their support, none of this would have been possible. Thankfully, they've taken a very long-term view on us as a business. They understand how long it takes and um, time to change. And, um, I cannot offer enough thanks to those two companies. Um, but I think a little bit of advice and say to, to anyone in the room, um, don't give up if you've got a new technology and you've got a new offering. Um, innovation always wins in the end. And it's all about using those strategic partnerships that you have and basically engaging with the right people, using people like the HSN to help you do that. And you will get there in the end. <laughs>